Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Briefings Direct Voice of the Customer podcast series. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host and moderator for this ongoing discussion on digital transformation success stories. Our next big data analytics and artificial intelligence strategies discussion explores how human capital management services provider ADP is unlocking new business insights from vast data resources. With more than 40 million employee records to both protect and mine, ADP is in a unique position to leverage its business data network for unprecedented intelligence on employee trends, risks, and productivity. By deploying the most advanced infrastructure to support data assimilation and refinement, a vast and secure data lake, and to build the foundations for machine learning, ADP is entering a bold new era in talent management. Stay with us now as we unpack how advances in infrastructure, data access, and AI combine to produce a step change in human capital analytics. With that, please join me now in welcoming our guests. We're here with Mark Rind, Vice President of Product Development and Chief Data Scientist at ADP Analytics and Big Data. Welcome to Briefings Direct, Mark. Thank you, Dana. We're also here with Dr. Englin Go. He's Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Higher Performance Computing and Artificial Intelligence at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Welcome, Dr. Go. Hi. Thank you for having me. We're delighted to have you with us. Mark, let's start with you. What's unique about this point in time that allows organizations like ADP to begin to do entirely new and powerful things with its vast data? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, Dana. I mean, what's changed today is obviously the ability to take data and not just data that you originally collect for a certain purpose. I'm talking about the data exhaust and to start using data for purposes that was not the original intention when you started collecting it. Everything around all of the vast amounts of payrolls that we process, we pay one in six people, full-timers in the U.S. So you can imagine quite the bit of data that we have around the country and around the world of work. But adding to that, it's also not just around how they're getting paid. It's how they're structured, what kind of teams are they in, um, advances, bonuses, uh, the types of hours that they work, everything across the, the talent landscape. It's data that we've been able to collect and curate and normalize and then aggregate and anonymize to start leveraging um, to build some true, truly fascinating insights that our clients are able to leverage. Yeah, it's, it's been astonishing to me that companies like yours are now saying, we want all the data we can get our hands on, and not just structured data, uh, all kinds of content, bringing in third parties. It's really uh, the more the merrier uh, when it comes to then the ability to gather entirely new insights. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And also with, you know, advances in methodologies to handle this data, uh, like you said, unstructured data, um, non-normalized data, you know, we're, t we're taking data from across hundreds of thousands of, of our clients all having their own way that they define and categorize and classify their workforce. So in able to, you know, now we're able to make sense of that right across the board by um, using various different approaches to to normalize and kind of get everyone on the same playing field so that we can start you know, building some insights across the board. So that's, that's something extremely exciting for us to be able to leverage. And Dr. Go, it's only been fairly recently that we've been able to get the ability to handle such vast uh, amounts of data in a simplified way at a manageable cost. So what are partners like HPE bringing to the table to support these data platforms and approaches and enable organizations like ADP to, to make uh, analytics actionable and even bring AI to the table now? This is an important point. You know, as Mark mentioned, massive amounts of data, not just the data you intend to, to keep, uh, but also uh, data exhaust. So he also mentioned uh, the need to curate it. So the, the, the idea for us in terms of data strategy with our partners and customers is one, of course, to retain data as much as you can. And then secondly, to ensure that you have the tools to curate it 
uh, because there's no point uh, having massive amounts of data over decades. And then when you need them to train a machine, you don't know where all the data is, right? So you need to curate it from the beginning. And if you've not curated it from the beginning, start curating your data now, right? And then the third area is to federate. So retain, curate, federate. Why is the third part, federate, important? Well, many huge enterprises, you know, would have uh, evolved and grown. And then a lot of the data starts to get siloed. And uh, Mark did mention about the data lake. This is one way to federate it, where you cut across the silos so that uh, you can train the machine more intelligent. So we build tools to provide for the retention, curation, and federation of data. Is this something that you're seeing across the board in many different industries? Where are people starting to really leverage things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and this new powerful infrastructure? Give us perhaps some use cases, examples. It all starts with the, the shift, right? It all evolved or it re-emerged when the industry shifted from one where prediction decisions were made uh, using rules or laws based, scientific law-based models. And then, uh, then there is this recent re-emergence of machine learning where instead of being based on laws and rules, you evolve your model from historical data. So data becomes uh, important here because the intelligence of your model is dependent on uh, the quality, the quantity and quality of the data you have. And in, in this, in, in using this approach, we have seen many new, new uh, use cases uh, emerged here yeah, using the machine learning approach of historical data. Uh, one, one would be um, farm uh, farming. Uh, the, my favorite example, right? We have uh, a farm combine company, and, and typically uh, what they would do when they want to spray herbicide on weeds, uh, they would spray the entire crop field. Now uh, they are training the camera system to recognize and differentiate between crop and weed. And then they attach these uh, smart cameras after training uh, on at the bottom of the combine now. And instead of spraying the entire crop field, they would just squirt specifically at the weed and avoid the crop. 90% reduction in herbicide use. Right? Good for the food we eat, good for the farmers reducing costs, and uh, good, for, uh, good for earth. Yeah. So this is one, one great example of how machine learning algorithm from historical data of uh, label pictures of crop and label pictures of different kinds of wheat, you can then use in, with enough of these high good quality examples, you can then start to be able to train a camera, camera system to differentiate. Let's go back to that in a while. I'd like to return to ADP because I think while this is specific to vertical industries, it seems to me that talent management is something that cuts across horizontally, uh, even, even globally. Uh, any business can leverage and exploit analytics about talent management and human capital management. So, uh, Mark, what has been a challenge in order to get talent management insights up until now? Uh, it seems to me that perhaps too much data was an issue or not getting access because of the privacy and other security issues. No, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, what, the Dr. Goh's example there as it pertains to talent management, any, anyone that we work with within the HCM space is always looking for an advantage to know where to go speak to their key employees to keep and retain, find, keep and retain their best talent. So much like training the system that can identify a crop versus the weed and understanding when to add water or when to spray, you know, whatever for weeds, pesticide, not exactly the same, but, but, you know, it, it could be something similar. You know, one thing that we do is, you know, looking at the vast amount of data that we have to identify those people who ended up leaving the organization, uh, voluntarily. Uh, versus those that stayed and growed, um, and were able to grow based on new opportunities, promotions, different methods of works, different teams. So pretty similar what we've been able to do using data, using the, the historical data, finding those patterns, and then starting to identify those who are the crops, right, and what to do about them, right, to keep them happier for longer. So this is a big shift, right, in, in the talent management space. Leveraging the data, so, uh, you know, seeing a lot of, it's not that it's too much data. I think uh, pouring it on to an HDM professional might be a bit much. So what we've done, we spent a lot of time to kind of handle it on their behalf for the HDM 
professional or the or even the managers to kind of push out the insights to them based on the data rather than bombard them with way too much data for them to need to interpret when at the end of the day, we're just really using artificial intelligence to say, hey, here are the people you should go speak with, or this manager has a lot of high-risk employees, or this is a job, critical job role that you might see you know, higher than expected turnover with and, and kind of point you in that direction to allow you to go um, figure out what to do about it. And that's a big shift in, in trying to explain it and simplify it, but at the same time also keep that data secure. Yeah, what Mark just said has uh, is also very similar to uh, customers uh, who are converting their call center voice recording into text and then, of course, uh, anonymizing it, but to then figure out the sentiment of their customers uh, it's through analysis of the text after they have been converted from uh, the voice recording. Um, and then to try and understand churn, right? Uh, for example, in the telco industry, they are very concerned about churn. Churn would mean that a customer leaving you for another. So, yes, very similar to go through a massive amounts of historical data. First, you have to get them, right? And they had them in these uh, recorded conversations. Now there are uh, smart tools, right, to be able to uh, convert them into and uh, transcribe them into text. And then you use a different set of tools to analyze those texts to figure out the sentiment of your customer. You know, when I first started doing some of these use cases around machine learning and artificial intelligence and big data, we would be talking to organizations like refineries or chemical plants, and they were delighted if they could get a half a percent or even a, a full percent improvement. It, it meant billions of dollars to them. But you all are talking about high impact, about employees and talent. It seems to me that this isn't just a, a shaving off of a, a rounding number of improvement, Mark. This is something that can seriously make or break a company's future. And in the case of things like productivity for call centers, a huge cost center. So, so let's look at what, you, you know, the stakes here. When we're talking about improving talent management, this isn't trivial. This is a major improvement for a company. It is. And it's, it's interesting. It's, Every company, any leader of an organization will tell you that their most important resource is the people that work for the company. And that's not an easy thing either to measure, right? You're not talking about how can we save on materials and the measurement and having it be smarter and in how it's used or, or um, electricity savings. You're talking about people that still need or, you know, at the end of the day are not exactly a, a resource as much as they are humans, right? Human beings that are trying to figure out what makes them tick and give the organization the insight of where people need to be growing and where you should spend the human time with them. So it's interesting where the artificial intelligence comes in is to provide that direction and offer suggestions and recommendations to keep those people there happy and productive. Now, there's also the other part of it is that in keeping them productive, automating a lot of the processes that are necessary for managers, for people, and kind of working through, you know, we have a lot of users, right, and they're punching clocks and managing time and approving pay cards and processing payroll. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that go on there. And, you know, there's a lot of paperwork that also we are, you know, using AI kind of simplifying and and kind of making recommendations and, and kind of handling a lot of those pieces for them so they can get back to, you know, for the HR professional to be focusing in on on the human part, right, on on going to be human and finding the managers and helping you know, grow careers rather than being stuck in you know, you know, processing paperwork and running reports, et cetera. It's interesting that at the time when we're seeing AI and machine learning have this major impact on one of the most important uh, resources and assets a company can have, it's human capital management. At the same time, we're seeing the infrastructure to support this go down in complexity, go down in cost, things like hyper-converged infrastructure, uh, the lowering cost of storage, the ability to create data centers that can be mirrored and backed up and protected, as well, of course, as the uh, ongoing improvements in composable infrastructure. So, Dr. Go, are we seeing a, a point in time where the benefits of machine learning and AI analytics are going up while the cost and composability of the infrastructure is, in fact, going down? Sure. Absolutely. That, that's actually the original reason why there is this reemergence of artificial intelligence through machine learning of historical data. These, uh, tech, uh, these capabilities, right, these uh, methods 
were already available decades ago, but the infrastructure was just too costly to amass so much enough data for the machine to be intelligent, all right, and enough compute power to go through that data for the machine to be intelligent, that it needed until now for these various infrastructures to come down in cost. Therefore, you start to see this reemergence of, of machine learning. So yes, if, if, if one were to ask, uh, you know, why is there in the last few years this uh, huge reemergence of machine learning towards artificial intelligence, uh, it would be cost, right? It has reached a certain point where uh, it is cost effective enough to amass the data. And also because of the internet now, uh, data is more easily accessible, but the cost of amassing it uh, is now more affordable, firstly. And then secondly, the cost of uh, compute capability to go through that data for the machine to learn has also come down sufficiently, and therefore the reemergence of uh, machine learning in the last mm-hmm. few years. Mark, I'd like to hear more about what it is that you're using for infrastructure to support your new value around machine learning and big data analytics. But first, for those who aren't that familiar with ADP, tell us a bit about your company. I think people might be familiar, familiar with you through payroll, but there's a lot more to it. And, and the, the scale of your company is actually astonishing to me. So tell us more about ADP, please. Sure, ADP, um, Automated Data Processing, data is our middle name, um, has been really working uh, within the world of work for now at a global scale for um, 70 years now. This is our 70th year, $12 billion in revenue, um, over 600,000 businesses ranging from multinational corporations down to three-person small businesses. And we process um, over $2 trillion in payroll and taxes um, and running about 40 million employee records uh, per pay period and uh, or rather per month. And basically, you know, because of that, the amount of data that we've been collecting across the board, now it's not just payroll, right? As I said earlier, you know, processing, you know, really getting into the talent space, right? So talent is a huge thing, obviously, within the world of work and finding and keeping those best resources. But it's also now moving forward, things around understanding engagement of your workforce, understanding uh, the, the new world of pay, right, and micro pay, uh, where people, you know, like the Uber of payment, right, people are getting, you know, being paid almost immediately. Working on spaces in that, the contingent workforce, the work market uh, of, you know, where people are, you know, we're seeing more and more movement from away from your traditional jobs and more into people performing jobs, right, and, and lots of different areas within the world of payroll processing and talent management is really gotten exciting. And I think, I think kind of coming back to the, the, the discussion of cost is, you know, with all of this and optimizing your workforce, but also understanding where there's opportunity to save the organization some, some lost dollars. So like we uh, were able, because of the amount of data, we can inform a client, not just on, okay, this is what your cost of turnover is, right? Based on uh, who's leaving and how long does it take them to get you know, produ- you know productive again and the cost of recruiting, but also showing you how you compare against others in your field. And that's the biggest piece of this, right, is that it's one thing to just share a number um, or share some information. It's another to give an insight to say, you know, this is – others have figured this out or others are handling this better or – are saving, you have potential to save more here as, as there are other methods out there that should be explored to help in retaining. So w- once you start turning things into a cost savings for an organization, whether it be in people that are leaving or getting them onboarded or cost in overtime, it, it starts to really pay off to show the insights of, of having that kind of data, not just about your own organization, but how you do compare it to others, um, other peers. So that, that's very exciting for us to be able to, to kind of point it back down to a number. Very keen to, to get reports uh, of, uh, you know, this, these kinds of intelligence uh, with regards to our talent. Right? I mean, even related to you know, the difficulty of hiring and retaining data scientists related to machine learning and artificial intelligence and ability to also, after hiring them uh, through reports, right, to understand if they are they're satisfied in their jobs, yeah. And that's key, and that's where you know we see the future of work, the future of pay going. Is you know, we have the organization, the clients, and the managers, but at the end, it's also data for the employee, 
right? It's, it, it's, it, we're in a new world of transparency around data, right? And people understand more and more and they're becoming more accepting of information and data as long as, you know, we're getting bombarded with it as well. But I also think as an employee, your partner in the growth and your career growth and your happiness at work is your employer, right? And that's the best partnership where the employer can understand how to put you into the right place, how to be more productive, what makes you tick. And as the employee, understanding what are your what are your strengths, right? And making sure that you're using your strengths every day and what you do will make you a happier, more productive employee. So there's that kind of that transparency and those conversations that can start to happen now because of the data. And it's really very exciting on, on where we think this this data is going to help guide us, both the employee, the manager, and the HR professional in the, uh, across the organizations. So uh, being at this uh, unique point in time when we can gather data like never before, process it at a lower cost than ever before, it seems to me that you have to start rethinking about your role as a company. So ADP is now in a position where because it has access to this data, because it's in a unique position, your value-added services are now at – you know, the level where the boards of directors and C-suite executives will be getting insights as a service from you. Uh, you're the one that are incurring the cost of that infrastructure, taking advantage of what HPE and others can provide uh, to crunch these numbers, provide this data, but you're elevating yourself. So did it require, Mark, sort of a rethinking of ADP's role, maybe even their philosophy in business that allows you to now provide not just information to the human capital management organization, but really to the highest echelons of any of, uh, of the businesses that, that you uh, support? It's really interesting, actually. Yeah, it is something that through the journey we've kind of discovered that providing insight to the HR professional and, and to practitioners of the software is one thing, right? And we realized that to really unleash it and to really unlock it, we needed to get it out into the hands of the managers and to the executives in the C-suite. And the best way we found to do that was we built um, through um, ADP's a mobile app, which is, the, I think it's in the top three most downloaded applications from the business section on the, on the iTunes store, is you know, people would get this application, check their pay stub, uh, manage their deduction, et cetera. But, but now through that application, starting to push up to the managers, to the executive insights around their organization, around what's going on. And, and that was a key part of this is to understand the persona find the elements of the data because they, look, they're busy running their organization. They might not have the time to pour through the data like a data scientist might, right, and and want to go through the data to find the insight. So we've built our engine to highlight, find and highlight the most important critical data points based on their statistical significance. Do you have an outlier? Are you in the bottom 10% as an organization, say, in new hire attrition? Whatever it, whatever it is, finding those insights and then starting to push it to the manager and executive so they get these headlines pushed to them. And then as they interact with the application, it kind of the intelligence starts to learn more about well, what's important to that manager and executive. So it's really um, – and then continues to push those insights related to what's most important to them. And that's where, you know, we see, you know, these value-added services, you know, around your organization – Telling you know, that executive is going to care about some things differently than what a supervisor might um, or a line manager, and just getting those insights out to them based on their own data when they need it uh, through the application versus them having to go in and get it. I think that push is a is a is a big win for us, and and we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of excitement from our clients that are starting to use this now. Doctor Go, are you seeing other companies also extending their business models and rethinking? who and what they are because of these new uh, analytics uh, opportunities? Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, the industry has shifted from one where your uh, differentiated asset is your method, and that's why we found patents, to, to also one where your differentiated asset is the data, right? Data becomes your new defensible asset uh, because from that data, you can build intelligent systems to make better decisions and better predictions. So you see that trend. And this, uh, this is also related to, to your earlier question. 
you know, in order for this trend to continue, the infrastructure must be there to be con- to continually reducing costs so you can handle the growing amount of data and, and not have the cost go unmanageable. And this is the reason why we've gone uh, with the uh, edge to, uh, to call to cloud uh, approach where the customer and the, the corporation implementing this uh, amassing of data in a curated way, a curated and federated way, can handle it uh, in a more cost-effective way depending on uh, their operating or, or capital budgets. Right. So, Mark, you're able to elevate your brand and your value through trends analysis around pay equity or turnover trends, uh, more executive insights around talent management, but that wouldn't be possible unless you were able to drill down and get to these higher level uh, technical uh, aspects. So maybe now would be a good time to look at what it is that you've got going on under the hood. What's going on in your infrastructure? What choices have you made to support this at the cost that then allows you to get those higher value benefits to your executives? Well, today we build everything um, on our on our development shop, um, and we're running or we collect all the data on our Cloudera platform, um, and we use various number of frameworks to kind of build the insights and then and then push those applications out through our whether it be directly in our area within the applications called Data Cloud, or um, we expose everything open opened up via RESTful API, so that those insights can kind of permeate throughout the entire ADP ecosystem, everything from a practitioner going in to onboard a, a new employee or starting to get insights right then and there from the recruiting um, end. So having that open API is a, is a very critical part to all of this. Dr. Go, uh, one of the things I've seen in the market is that the investments that companies like ADP make in the infrastructure to support big data analytics and artificial intelligence sets in motion a virtuous adoption benefit. That is to say, the investments to process the data leads to an improvement in analytics, which then brings in more interest and consumption of those analytics, which leads to the need for more data and more analytics. So what's the trend for you? What would you tell other companies about getting into this sooner rather than later of working up that maturity of a starter to advanced in terms of consumption of, of machine learning capabilities because it seems to me it's a gift that keeps giving and it grows in value over time. We group our customers uh, in, in, in this journey, right, uh, as early, started, or advanced, three different groups, yeah. About 70% of our customers are in the early phase, um, about 20% in the started phase where they have already started on a project, and about 10% are in the advanced phase. The advanced phase customers would be like the automotive customers who are already on uh, autonomous vehicles, but would like us to come in and help them with infrastructure to deal with the massive amounts of data. But the majority of our customers are in the early phase. For those, uh, when we engage with, with them, the, uh, the immediate discussion would be to get started, right? Uh, let's pick a low-hanging fruit that has an outcome that's measurable that, uh, that would be interesting. Uh, so th- we work with the customer on that. And then after we've decided... Uh, what outcome to aim for in, in this, uh, where we start the machine learning project on. The next thing we would uh, talk about would be, do you have the data? Do you have sufficient data? And if so, uh, that would take a long time to clean it up and normalize it so you can consume it, as Mark mentioned. Uh, after that phase, uh, we try to start a, a proof of concept for that low-hanging fruit outcome, and, and hopefully it, it turns out well. And then from there, uh, the early customer can approach their management for you know, concrete for solid funding uh, to get them started on an operational project. So that's that's typically how we would do it, and it always starts with the outcome. What are we aiming for for this machine once it's trained, once it's gone through the learning phase? What is it trying to achieve, and would that achievement be meaningful for the company? A low hanging fruit one. It doesn't have to be complex. And the second question would be: Do they have the data? And, and does it take a long time to clean and normalize it? All right. Well, we're almost out of time. Mark, uh, any words of wisdom looking back with 2020 hindsight as you've now been going through this journey as you described it for other companies that might be considering bigger, jumping deeper into the pool, if you will, or the deep end of the pool when it comes to the investments around big data lakes and, and AI and analytics, uh, you know, what would you tell them if they're just getting started or are only into the, the shallow end of the pool? 
much to Dr. Goh's point, you know, picking a project I think is a, is, a, is a very important idea to kind of go for something that is, is tangible and you have the data for. I, I think that's always it's always important to get a win, right, instead of boiling the ocean, just to prove some value up front. I think also the other thing is to, you know, a lot of more large organizations, uh, you could get a bunch of, instead of building data lakes, you end up with a bunch of data puddles. You get different areas of the organization, different groups building their own. So you could have, like, look, I'm in the product area, but of course there's sales, there's implementation, there's service. So one thing that we've done is we've committed to localizing all of that data into a, into a data lake, into a single lake. And, and the reason being is that now you can start connecting data that you would never think you would connect before. So understanding what the sales and the service process is, how that might ultimately impact or inform the product, right, or vice versa, is only truly capable if you start putting your data all together. And then once you get it together, just work on connecting it up. I, I think that's, that's a very key point to look to kind of yeah. open it up across the organization. Yeah, key uh, common denominator here is it's just going to increasingly be more and more data. We're starting to see the Internet of Things and the industrial Internet of Things, which will bring more data, which I would think would still be even relevant to something like talent management, that there's still ways of gathering even more data about what people are doing, how they're working, what their efficacy is in the field, uh, especially across organizational boundaries like a contingent workforce, uh, being able to measure what they're doing and then pay them accordingly. So last thought to you, Mark. Do you see that as well, that even more data is going to be coming online and that we're going to need to have the ability to, to measure even more about how people work? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no way around it. Today, I mean, there's a lot of dis disconnected points of data, for sure, but I think the connection points are going to just continue to be made possible, right? So you get a full 360 view of the world at work, right, so that you can – understand how they're working, how to make them more productive and engaged, adding flexibility to the ability of on how they want to work, but only by connecting up data across the board and, and pulling it all together would that be possible. Yeah, we haven't even scratched the surface of incentivization types of uh, uh, interesting trends that we could see that the more data allows you to actually incentivize people on a on a micro basis. So an entirely interesting new chapter. I'll have to wait for another day, another podcast to get into that. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. We've been discussing how Global Human Capital Management Services Provider, ADP, has unlocked new business insights and services from its vast data resources. And we've learned that by deploying the most advanced infrastructure and foundation for artificial intelligence, a new era is dawning for such high-level capital improvements of talent management and measuring and metering for contingent workforces. So please join me now in thanking our panel, Mark Rind, Vice President of Product Development and Chief Data Scientist at ADP Analytics and Big Data. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for having me, Dana. And we've also been here with Dr. Englin Go. He's Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Higher Performance Computing and Artificial Intelligence at HPE. Thank you so much, Dr. Go. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Mark. A big thank you as well to our audience for joining us for this Briefings Direct Voice of the Customer Digital Transformation Success Story. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at InterArbor Solutions, your host for this ongoing series of Hewlett Packard Enterprise sponsored interviews. Thanks again for listening. And please pass this along to your IT community and do come back next time. <music>